Um, yes, yeah, so th thanks, thanks very much for that. My Nick. pleasure. And thanks to you, uh, Nick, for yeah, uh, bringing, bringing that to us. And um, so um, now I, um, we, our, our idea is to kind of um, let each piece of the input kind of build um, on the previous part. And in that spirit, I'm going to invite um, Zoe and Laura to um, kind of illuminate and kind of give some context to what, uh, what Nick's been talking about. So over to you, uh, Zoe and Laura. Hi, everyone. Hi. I will just try and share my screen. I'm hopeful that you can see that now. Uh, yes, uh, we can yeah. see that, Laura. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, as Toby said, I'm Laura Robinson. I'm the assistant head teacher here at Northwood Primary School. And I'm Zoe Beach. I'm the executive head teacher for Northwood Primary School and Heathfield Primary Schools, both in Darlington. In Darlington. Um, so, to give you, we're here today to talk about how our outdoor learning offer and how we use that to tackle inequality at Northwood Primary School. Um, so, to give you a little bit of context. Um, Here's some information about our school. We do serve a really disadvantaged population and we know that for lots of our children, even if they're not pupil premium or classed as disadvantaged, they're still quite vulnerable um, for, for many different reasons. 40% of our school population at the moment are in the bottom 5% of the country for deprivation. Um, so our outdoor learning offer really is targeted um, at our disadvantaged context. Our school motto here at Northwood is growing success and it's really rooted in everything that we do right the way through our curriculum um, from nursery to year six and preparing children for their life after year six and um, into secondary school too. Um, we want our children to know that success grows from any starting point despite their background. Um, and so we really link that into our outdoor learning offer. Um, we know that most of our children really don't have gardens, yards, even an outdoor space uh, to play in outside at home. And we don't want this to be a barrier to our children. So our outdoor learning curriculum is all around enabling children to have these opportunities that they might not get outside of school. Yeah, so obviously, you know, uh, if you are in, in the primary sector, we know the value of outdoor learning, especially in the early years. Um, and what we've decided as a school is to really look at the fact that with all the principles that we, we, that we teach and that children learn right from being three in our, in our school, um, when they get to year, year one, um, almost that outdoor learning offer slightly shifts for our children. Um, so a few years ago, what we did was really look at the fact that um, what would enable our children to continue to make the most progress, to continue to develop key skills, knowledge and understanding that they needed, and ensure that our children got the opportunities to go outside and be um, really think about how they look after and value the environment alongside using it as a resource to learn in. Um, we, we, we really see our children when they come in at three absolutely flourish in our early years provision. It's a very um, small area, however, it's um, really, um, really well designed. And one of the things that we noticed was that our children lacked a real understanding about um, how things grow and because a lot of them don't actually have a garden haven't got space in their back you know in their garden to actually they haven't got a garden so they can't grow things in the in the traditional way that we we might expect them to so we look to create a recycled garden so that the children right from the start when they join our school know that they can grow anything in anything so we went and we collected as you can see in the the photographs there. We went to um, collect um, toilets that were no longer used, chest of drawers that we had in school that actually, you know, we, we're, we couldn't use inside. We looked for wellies, we looked for anything and actually developed um, a project with our youngest learners to really get them to really start and think about how they care for something, how they nurture something and how they see it actually flourish and grow like we want the children to. 
Um, as you can see in the photographs here, one of the key things that we wanted our children to understand is that um, by doing, you know, by doing that care, by doing certain jobs and things, that they actually could see the benefits of all that hard work. Um, so our children will end up in the early years making soup, making salads, thinking about different herbs and their uses. But also they start to show much more respect for plants when they're out and about. Um, and also they're not, they become less afraid of mini beasts and the mm -hmm. um, little creatures that join us in our garden. Um, the other thing that we're really clear about with our youngest learners and the staff that work with them is that these skills that they're, that they're building right from the start help them to be good writers, help them to be good thinkers and problem solvers. So even when they're watering the plants, they water from left to right. So the children start to understand that left to right you know, is used all the time in their writing. So when they're developing those skills, we're doing it for another purpose. It's not just to grow something. Um, the thing that we noticed in our school was once the children had left our early years, those opportunities to grow and develop things and, and you know, sort of continue that nurturing care stopped. So we asked ourselves the question, because we're very question focused in our school, if the benefits for our younger children had been outstanding, why would we stop there? And as a staff, we then made the, asked the staff about that and got them thinking about, so what, why do we stop what we do that we know works so well and what can we do to actually continue that provision well beyond the um, early years um, offer in the school. So as a result of, um, of all of that that Zoe's just talked through, um, our outdoor learning offer became a school priority and it's in our school development plan and it's something that we're continually trying to enhance the offer for our children. Um, we really want to develop our learners into to becoming confident and self-assured and again giving them those opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily or ordinarily have available to them if they weren't in school what we well what we do a lot of the time at northwood is that we try and implement things that are rooted in research and reading um, and like nick was just sharing with you one of the books he's been working from um, a lot of our principles come from dirty teaching by juliet robertson um, it's about us all learning at all levels so around the leaders having the knowledge and understanding um, before we share it with the staff and then sharing that with the children and that last notion there on, um, I mean, you can read the slides for yourself, but the last power, uh, bullet point that says about making the most of any place or space is what really resonates with us. Um, we wanted to look at our school grounds and to be able to enhance them as best we possibly could and make the, the best use of any place or space we had in school. And I'll come on to how we did that in a couple of slides time. So, um, Naturally, we had to start with the staff. Um, we worked with wilderness schooling, Northeast Wellbeing, and upskilled our staff as best as possible to, um, so that they felt confident on delivering strategies for learning outside the classroom. And this was part of a continued piece of CPD. So we did um, PD days, staff meetings, and it was, it was ongoing. And one of the first things we did was we asked the staff to sort of come up with barriers that they were worried about might um, might limit their opportunities outside. And things that the staff were coming up with were barriers such as weather, health and safety, behaviour, equipment, clothing required. And so we took all of that back to um, senior leadership level and with our we have an outdoor learning lead in school and we took those barriers and created them and turned them into enablers so we looked at what staff were worried about almost and concerned about and thought how we could support them so that their barriers were reduced so we started looking at what we had available at school and, and how we could enhance it even further and we were definitely thinking all the time about our disadvantaged children and children with special educational needs and how we can meet their individual needs through different areas in our school grounds. So you can see here we've got um, 
we've got an outdoor classroom, a wilderness area, uh, that's the nursery garden that we spoke about earlier. And so what we did, or I say we, it was our outdoor learning lead, who is absolutely fantastic. And she was um, blessed, if you like, with some additional time during the first lockdown where um, Gemma, our outdoor learning lead, was really able to take those opportunities that were afforded to her around CPD and spent a lot of time constructing an outdoor guide to support teaching staff with their delivery of outdoor learning. Um, and she created this a grounds guide, school grounds guide. So you can see from this um, aerial view of our school, we're really lucky to have a huge school field. Um, and we think now, yes, we've got a school field, but what else can we use it for that's not just PE and sports? Um, and there's other, we've got a mugger, wilderness garden, trim trail. Um, you can see that we've enhanced, or when we get onto it, you'll see that we've enhanced these areas as best as possible to provide opportunities for learning outside for the children. Um, so here we have an example of our school grounds guide, which if anybody's interested is saved on our website on the outdoor learning section. So you can have a look in there because this basically gives a really detailed overview of each of the outdoor areas in school the resources that are available at that area, examples of what you could do there, and um, additional resources and links that might be helpful or useful for teachers when they're planning their outdoor learning sessions. Um, so here's an example, that, which is the Willow Wall. Um, in the picture there, it was ongoing, but it looks it's moved on a lot more from that point. And then as part of that planning guidance for the staff, we created these non-negotiables and these were done with the staff and shared them with the children so everyone was involved um, we agreed that children should have at least one session of outdoor learning each week um, outside of the classroom it's not an option to opt out um, and we talked about how those barriers such as the weather and things can be managed uh, establishing rules routines and boundaries when learning outside of the classroom staff um, are trained in creating a risk benefit assessment including meeting the needs of specific children in the class children who might have behavioral needs or any additional needs um, that might need extra support outside and then finally all teachers use the saged model for planning so that is the s is for staff the staff have they got the relevant experience the a activity what are they planning the g is considering the group and mix of children so the age and maturity of learners, the academic levels of learners, their behaviour, their past experience. What we actually find is that in the classroom, the traditional rank of more able and less able children really disappears outside and the children, all children can be successful. And actually, we were finding that our more able children were less likely to take risks. Um, and some of our special needs children and lower ability learners were great risk takers and, and absolutely, yeah, flourish, absolutely flourish outside. Um, we also know that our children can get themselves involved out of school in antisocial behaviour. Um, we sometimes get phone calls from the police letting us know about some of the things our children have been up to outside. So what we really want to be able to do at Northwood is teach them how to take safe risks in a controlled area in school. So we do light fires and we do carry out activities where they might have to climb a little bit of a tree, but it's all planned and there's a risk assessment around it and they're taught the risks involved. And we believe that if they're doing it in a safe environment in school, they're less likely to want to experiment outside of school. And um, back to SAGED model. So the E is the environment for weather and the D is for distance. And that really is how close the adults in the classroom and um, how close the adults outside are to support from another adult if they need it. Um, and so what we did to overcome that is we literally simply just bought a set of walkie talkies and any teacher that's going outside to deliver outdoor learning takes a walkie talkie with them. That's um, there's another one in the school office. And if they have an issue, first aid, medical or any issues at all, they can walkie talkie someone back in school. Realise I've been probably talking over my time, our time. So I'll try and wrap up. Um, another great. Well, don't worry about that you've got plenty of time sure? okay thanks Toby. Yeah. relax relax 
<laughs> um, so another great book um, is Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. Really, um, it's rooted again in everything we do here at Norfolk. We want to make learning stick. Um, and they use the success acronym to, to really consider how children can be successful outside of the classroom. Um, we know that sometimes outside the simple activities can be um, more, more exciting for children. So the S for simple really means that less is more. So most activities outside rely on the resources that are found out there and mean we don't have to lug tons of equipment and things outside because the children are exploring and finding their own resources um, whilst out there and really using their imagination to support their learning too. The U for unexpected. Um, we know that outdoor learning can often end up being interrupted by one thing or another. For example, a cat might walk across the playground. And what we try to do is make the most of that new learning experience that might not have been planned for. And our staff are great in knowing that if the learning objective hasn't been met or hasn't been fully met in that lesson, the chances are another objective generally has been met because of that unexpected um, thing that might happen outside. Just like everything in school, um, we really use have a heavy focus on concrete resources, makes, more, uh, makes experiences much more relevant for children, and then they can tend to link those experiences more to real life events, um, people, the community, and give some practical skills that they can take outside of the lessons as well. Credible is the next C. Working outside seems to naturally lend itself to the children's lives, interests, and especially coming out of the lockdown, they lost so much time outdoors. So we want to be able to give the children those multi-sensory experiences um, by using as many of their senses as possible to explore outside. Emotional is the E, um, and that's what we call the OOR factor. Um, and it's when you hear the children really, really engaged and emotive around their learning. Um, we know that when we hear those sounds, a connection has been made between the learners and the outdoor environment. So, of course, learning is a cognitive process, but it's an emotional process just as much uh, equally as well. Um, stories. So it, at Northwood, stories are absolutely embedded right the way through our curriculum. We know everybody loves a good story. We love a good story. We like telling stories and everyone remembers a good story. So the, um, one of the ways that we hook children outside is through story, drama, role play, um, making a narrative out of the outdoor experience because then these, that can then be a springboard to activities that they then go back into the classroom to do. So they've got that lovely story to link back to, to support them when they get back in their classrooms. Um, at Northwood, we do have some children with quite complex additional needs. Generally, these children have an education health care plan. And um, what we try to do is if they have to access alternative provision for some of their day or week, um, we try and look for a provision that has similar values to what we do. So this is a couple of our children that go uh, that went to outdoor ambition. Um, and Outdoor Ambition worked really closely with us to think about the needs of our children and we said we know that outdoor learning works for them. So um, here's some lovely photos that they were able to go and explore and experience some time really to meet their social, emotional and mental health needs but still whilst being outdoors. I'm just talking, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know in a previous webinar, and I don't know if any of the attendees attended last time, Zoe and I spoke about our recovery curriculum that we were, that is still ongoing, um, and it was designed to support children socially and emotionally when they return to school after the first lockdown. Um, as, as a school, we continually seek to take advice from other professionals and we value the advice of other professionals. And so for this, we worked really closely with our educational psychology team. Um, we know that they add value to what we do and um, so we invested a lot of time into that. I won't go into too much around what our recovery curriculum 
um, is designed around or what it's about but just to say that our staff as part of that recovery curriculum have planned and prioritised opportunities for outdoor learning because we know they've missed so many opportunities to do that over the past year and year and a bit and that's still ongoing now so when we designed the recovery curriculum initially we didn't know that we were then going to go back into a lockdown and we'd have similar um, issues to deal with when the children came back to school so our outdoor learning offer is as important, more important now probably than, than ever before. And that is us done. So does anybody have any questions? I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, thank you very much, um, Zoe. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so there's, um, I was just uh, sitting there and becoming kind of, you ignited the kind of uh, the teacher in me <laughs> well, the, the wants to know the, the, some practical details and um, I, I see that reflected in the chat too and um, so people want to know some practical things but I just uh, just to start us off because it builds a, a little bit on what Nick was saying about learning being an emotional um, journey as well as a, a practical information processing journey and I wonder what you I was very interested to hear that some of your more able learners were those who outdoors um, appeared to be taking less risk. I wonder what, what, what you thought was behind that. Um, I think some of our more able children become quite confident within the classroom, but then the structure of the session potentially is, changes once we go outside and that sometimes we lose some of the routine of a, a general, a normal teaching session that's inside. Um, and so they they tend to shy away a little bit more, whereas some of the other children who who struggle more in the classroom, really, you really see their confidence and it uh, flourish. And I don't think it, that it's the more able children regress or anything when they're outside. I think it is just the noticeable difference in the less able children and their confidence when they get outside. It's been fascinating. Yes, I mean, we, we all know that um, we, we can adapt to a particular environment and then we get anxious to if, if we, even as adults, we have to go to a different, uh, different context. And so um, it's, it's interesting to observe, isn't it? And um, I, I, in my input, which is coming up, I'll be talking a little bit about, about the, the implications of making abstract tasks practical. Um, which is, I know, something that you've been working on at Northwood, but that has implications for children who are more kind of practically minded um, and whose skills are not sort of, um, they don't shine in the classroom. So there was, there was some kind of some, um, some lovely sort of practical things. I can sort of hear colleagues um, kind of uh, their brains whirring. Um, how am I going to get this done in my school? And I know, especially as a colleague from um, Highfield Middle School in Prada, um, w welcome to you, um, who's, who has a sort of the challenge of doing something similar um, with, uh, over the summer. And um, so I kind of, how would, there's a, there's a point about how did you get this funded, but there's also um, any advice that you give to something set, setting up something like this? One of the things I would say that we, 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 we really tapped into was the expertise of our early years staff. So because they naturally have to consider um, the, the, the outdoor classroom as well as the indoor classroom, sometimes they're uh, an untapped resource that um, almost keeps themselves very niche for our up to five year olds without the, the, the really seeing that they can actually really influence and shape practice beyond um, you know, that early years offer. So our early years, uh, our outdoor lead, um, we gave her, so if you think about it you know, pragmatically, we look to give um, TLRs, TLR threes for some of our key staff in school. And one of our reception teachers, because she's so fantastic at delivering outdoor learning with the youngest children in our school, it naturally lent itself to give her an opportunity to take on a bit more of a leadership role and influence practice beyond, beyond early years. And at first she was extremely nervous about that until she understood really what it was that we were trying to develop in the school. Once we got that person in place, we then worked with wilderness schooling 
and we look to create almost a bespoke plan um, of CPD where well, staff, teachers and teaching assistants were trained in triads um, for shorter periods of time but to enable us to actually demonstrate ideas and techniques for teaching English outside, maths outside and then science outside. They were the three key priorities to start with and those triads then um, we used to train other staff in school. So there was a you know, very clear strategy about who, who was trained first and how they then led an influence training beyond, beyond that with other members of staff in school. And then our CPD session with Wilderness School in, like you say, really looked at the barriers that some teachers faced. Because there was, you know, be honest, there was a bit of resistant, resistance, especially from teachers of children um, further up the school in year five and six where they maybe have never really other than playground duty or going outside for PE hadn't really potentially considered the real value of what they could do outside but what we what we begin, began to understand was initially they were taking their English lesson and thinking right, I'm going to deliver that English lesson outside. Well, that's not what outdoor learning is about. So we had to understand where the teachers were on that pathway and then, um, you know, take their feedback and then work with them a bit to enable them to be more confident and successful. So we paired them up with early years teachers and practitioners who are adept to doing that every day. Um, in terms of funding, we looked to use some of our pupil premium funding because actually we knew that it was going to make a, a massive difference to our to our children. But it was about upskilling staff first, and then naturally seeing the impact all the time. Um, so that's probably the strategy that we. Can yeah, I can see that there's a couple of questions about um, whether the children see it as outdoor learning or as English or maths, and it, it they do see it as we're doing maths. Um, and it's just an extension to the maths curriculum, mm -hmm. yet we're able to weave in so many more of those social and emotional and team building skills and mm -hmm. resilience and, and all of those skills that we do target in the classroom, but we can do it on such a bigger scale outside. Um, so it's not that they don't see it as the lesson is outdoor learning, the lesson is science or the lesson is maths. The outdoors, like you say, is, the, is an extension to the classroom now at Northwood, so um, and, and staff are really good at sharing with each other some of the, the strategies that they've used and where there was success and where potentially we need to think differently about taking children outside. But it's definitely, um, like you say, leveled the playing field because we're all for all children being able to demonstrate all of their skills and talents. So we, you know, we want children to be creative. We want artistic skills and uh, you know and, and skills to be celebrated we want children who are more physical than others to actually be the leaders physically so they they but they we don't naturally set out to, to to sort of put children into certain skill levels they naturally do it themselves outside thank you thank you very much Zoe that's uh, kind of re really helpful and uh, Nick do you have any reflections on those? well I was just going to put in a few other questions just so we, um, Alison's asked in the Q&A box there um, <clears throat> have you noticed any difference in uh, any positive difference in the behavior when, when they're more occupied so a little bit on that absolutely I mean we really have to as I said earlier think about the groups of children that we take outside it takes real planning and risk assessment beforehand and um, then a reflection after the session on how well the children mix together in groups and then we're able to take what we've seen and the skills that we've seen the children develop outside back into the classroom so yes absolutely okay alice is saying that she's doing some provision plans currently um, you probably come onto this but i'm sure you're happy to link up with people and help because you're a very outward facing group of people. Um, I think you've covered the core subject bit that Fiona raised about maths lessons. Um, 
Yeah, and we, we capture our outcomes through our, we have um, like floor books that go right the way through yeah. school and what, we'll, what we try and celebrate in, in them reg and, and staff share them regularly with each other mm. is those <coughs> communities that add that extra value for, um, for, for, for our children. Um, and, you know, like you say, the photographs that are taken aren't just one-off photographs that are taken, but mm. that element of story teachers use those photographs to get children to know more, do more, remember more. So they go back in time, use the photographs as part of the narrative and then move the children's learning on the next time. So did you, was the, did Wilderness Schooling do the training for maths and science is a question? That's yes. a yes. yes. Okay, that's helpful to cover that one. Yeah. Um, but it was in discussion about being really, really bespoke about what we were wanting those sessions to be so they are you know and, and Wilton School were brilliant at adapting their model to actually benefit this you know what, what our intention was mm. and I guess the other question I had really was about um in in the spirit of progress not perfection mm -hmm. kind of thing you know you're you're down you know and I know you're not trying to get a perfect model but you're, you're you're quite a way down the line with it as we can see and it's you know pretty nailed on um for people less less far down the journey what what practical advice just a couple of nuggets might you give give to folk who might be in the in the in the uh attending this webinar well be brave and do it but take your children just take them outside and and observe your children in a different in, in a different environment the other practical advice i would give is really look at your outdoor space and think about are you maximizing its potential you know, is there a space that's actually not used at the moment that could become another extension of your in, of your classroom and environment? It's potentially getting the staff just to look differently and notice what they notice. And those things, that, that would be yeah. my advice. And the reading, well. the, yeah. those two books that we shared, um, definitely worth a read. Yeah. T Toby, I'm going to develop my Zoom skills because we're learning together with this stuff, aren't we? I'm yeah. going to allow e Emma to yeah. ask a question because she's got her hand up. So Emma, when I press this button, it allows you to talk. Over to you. You'll have to unmute and then you can ask your question. Um, sorry, yeah. I think that was by accident. Well, don't say sorry because I, <laughs> by accident, that, that's the joy of learning, isn't it? You did it by accident. I've now learned how to make a, a, an attendee, how, I, how to allow them to ask a question so you're not to worry. Okay, um, just looking down the, the yes. Um, Yes, yeah, just a comment really about using old furniture and household items that come free of charge. Alison says it's great. <clears throat> so lots of lots of feedback to you, to Zoe and Laura on that. Toby, back over to you. I'll shut up now. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so um, it's um, um, again sort of tr trying to make a through line of learning in this webinar. Um, we've uh, we've taken sort of Nick's uh, the Nick's kind of a setting out of the um, um, the emotional aspects of being a leader, and how that how that transfers into the classroom. And this um, Zoe and Laura have been telling us about um, how an outdoor program um, kind of de delivers and develops energies in the children um, around their learning styles and their the courage for learning really. Um, also, the implications for colleagues who have been a bit